So the thing about the 2001 situation, though, that I'd like to uh, remind you of, or perhaps share with you, because many of you were not really conscious of that period of time, there still was no great power rivalry attached to this. In fact, I think you would argue that the great powers cooperated. Um, the Russians, for instance, were the greatest source of war material for the Northern Alliance, which was a part of the coalition that overthrew the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, the international community agreed on UN Security Council resolutions that made it possible to track terrorist financing across international borders. The uh, Proliferation Security Initiative was created, which allowed countries to stop suspicious cargo at ports or to deny landing rights to aircraft that were thought to be carrying suspicious cargo. Uh, 90 countries were a part of the Proliferation Security Initiative, including Russia, China, and, uh, and others. And so this was a period in which the great powers seemed to find common purpose in fighting terrorism. And very important to note that this was especially true with Russia. Vladimir Putin really believed that he had found a new strategic rationale for relations with the United States, and it was around fighting terrorism. Because President Bush said in the war on terrorism, if you, you're either for us or against us, and included all terrorist activity in our concerns, including what was going on in Chechnya, not the brutality of the Russians in Chechnya, but the fact that there were a lot of Chechens who really had come into bad company. When we liberated mazar -e sharif in Afghanistan, we found Chechens uh, among Al-Qaeda. And so there was a kind of coming together of Russian strategic objectives and American strategic objectives. And Russia turned out to be one of our strongest allies, both in terms of intelligence and in terms of law enforcement. Seems like a long time ago that that was the case, but that was how Vladimir Putin saw it, and that was how it played out. But that world uh, would not last. It would start to break apart on uh, for a number of reasons. And the first comes back again to what happened with the two great powers that we believed we had made a kind of permanent strategic alliance with after uh, the end of World War uh, at the end of the Cold War. Let's take Russia first. I mentioned that Vladimir Putin believed that he had found a, a strategic rationale for the U.S.-Russian relations, and it was the fight against terrorism. The problem was that the Bush administration saw the fight against terrorism not just as counterterrorism, but needing a positive story as well. And so the freedom agenda became the other part of the war on terrorism. In other words, you couldn't just be negative and fight terrorists. You had to give people a more hopeful future. And we believe that meant a democratic future as well. It explains why in places like Afghanistan, uh, the United States didn't go there to, to bring democracy, but it was a security situation. But it was felt that we should leave a decent Afghanistan and that decent Afghanistan would be a democratic Afghanistan where women and everyone else could prosper. Similarly, in Iraq, that once you overthrew Saddam Hussein for security reasons, because we thought there were weapons of mass destruction there, you would have to have an idea about what followed next. And we believed a democratic Iraq. And now all of a sudden, Vladimir Putin says, wait a minute, I didn't sign on for this freedom agenda part. I didn't sign on for this democracy part. And so uh, as the freedom agenda, the democracy part began to spread, particularly into parts of the former Soviet Union, Vladimir Putin really felt betrayed. And it was most neuralgic for him when it spread to Ukraine. The origins of what we're seeing today are in Vladimir Putin's concern about internal developments in Ukraine, which were leading Russia to uh, be supplanted, in his view, 
by a Western orientation in Ukraine that was more democratic. I have to stop here to uh, just lay to rest one argument that's out there, which was that this is all about NATO expansion. In the eight years that I worked with Vladimir Putin, he did not mention NATO expansion to me or to President Bush. If it had been that important to him, you would have thought he would have mentioned it. The only time that NATO expansion became an issue was when we decided we would put missile defenses in Poland and Romania and uh, possibly in the Czech Republic. Then he said that it would be a threat. But the idea that that not, that uh, NATO expansion was a problem for him is simply ahistorical. So back to our story about the emergence of uh, problems for the international system. Russia now begins to emerge not as a partner, as we had hoped after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but as a particular kind of rival. And the Russia that emerged, of course, was not uh, a particularly strong Russia. In fact, it was a declining power. If you thought about Russia's economy on any given day, it was at best 11th or 12th in the world. If you thought about, uh, if you think about whether you had ever bought anything made in Russia that wasn't made from petroleum, and don't say vodka, that would be bought in France uh, these days, the, the Russians were a weak declining power but a power still with plenty of capability to make trouble in the world, whether through cyber attacks, interference in people's elections, or as we've seen, the decision to actually invade Ukraine and turn the clock back on uh, the collapse of uh, Russian power in Eastern Europe. Russian, uh, the Russian attitudes toward Ukraine led Putin to make this set of miscalculations that led directly to the hot spot that we now call the Ukrainian war. For Vladimir Putin, Ukraine was not a real country. In fact, he told us that Ukraine was a made up country. Now, what did he mean by that? He meant that in the Russian way of thinking about it, and this is actually true, not just of Putin, but many Russians, Ukraine had not really been an independent country for very much of its history. In fact, Ukraine, they believed, Putin believed, was just kind of little Russia. There is a Tchaikovsky suite called Little Russia. It is about Ukraine. That tells you something about how deeply held in the Russian culture this idea is. But of course, the Ukrainians are a distinct people with a distinct language. I speak Russian. I can easily make mistakes translating from Ukrainian because they are distinct languages. It is a country that has come, particularly over the last uh, 30 years or so, to see itself as even more distinct. And so when Putin invaded Ukraine, thinking that Ukrainians would welcome Russia, it was based on this view that Ukraine isn't really a country and that people like Zelensky were really um, pretenders to uh, the throne for the Ukrainians. And so the first miscalculation was not understanding the Ukrainians. The second miscalculation was believing that the West would not act, uh, perhaps thinking that Afghanistan and the messy withdrawal from Afghanistan was evidence of uh, the America's inability to, to uh, act. Uh, surprised then at the level, depth, and breadth of sanctions uh, that have been levied. And then the third and perhaps most important miscalculation, he actually thought his army was good. And it turns out it isn't. Uh, after the debacle, and it was a debacle in 2008 in Georgia, they spent billions and billions and billions of rubles rebuilding the armed forces. And they've turned out not to be very good after all. And so this has led to this miscalculation by Putin and the decision to invade Ukraine. Now, this, of course, makes great power, takes great power rivalry to a completely different level, because what we've done in response is something that we've never tried before. In contrast to the integrationist economic narrative that the United States has always had, we have sought to, with our allies, isolate the 11th largest economy in the world and take it out of the international economy. 
Uh, that will have consequences, but it is just one of the uh, ways of thinking about how far great power rivalry has gone in, has gone in this case. Of course, the other big rival and the other big challenge to the system comes from China. And the seeds of that great power rivalry also come from the period uh, between 1989 and uh, roughly 2001. When China decided to become a part uh, under Deng Xiaoping of the international economy, the West faced a choice. You could say to the Chinese, good luck on your own and try to isolate 1.4 billion people because they were not a democracy, because their uh, economic principles did not conform to WTO standards, or you could decide, you know, you can't leave a billion four people outside of the system. And so we will bring China into the international economy, frankly, prematurely, in hopes that being a part of the WTO, being brought into the international economy, being a part of the answer to international economic growth, China will actually start to conform to those standards. But of course, that didn't happen. China continued to uh, be a problem for intellectual property rights. China continued to, uh, to refuse to allow foreign um, companies into large parts of its economy. And China continued to champion national champions who would then uh, take that IP or uh, joint ventures that didn't work out. And so what had been a lot of hope about how China would integrate into the international economy became skepticism, even disappointment about it. That was happening before the rise of Xi Jinping. But with the rise of Xi Jinping, we had another factor. China under Hu Jintao, who was the president that I dealt with, and Zhang Zemin, who was in power when we first came to office, China had engaged in something called hide and bide. In other words, don't try to act like a great power. Just bide your time, grow stronger. And one day China will have its day, but don't force it. In fact, this sometimes made it difficult to get China to do useful things in the international economy. Uh, we made China the chair in what was called the six party talks on North Korean nuclear uh, weapons. And it was very hard to get China to act in an assertive way. Well, Xi Jinping had a very different view, which was that China ought to act in a very assertive way. And on the basis of Chinese economic growth, which a couple of years ago, people were starting to talk about the Chinese economy surpassing the US economy, Xi Jinping decided that this was his moment. In deciding that this was his moment, uh, China began to make claims and military moves in the South China Sea. China moved hard against Hong Kong, one of the elements of what Xi Jinping hopes to be the restoration of China before colonialism. Moving hard against uh, Hong Kong, completely abrogating the decision, uh, the agreements of 1997 uh, of one uh, country, two systems, and of course, in some ways, the biggest threat, uh, beginning to use language about Taiwan and beginning to engage in activities about Taiwan that make people suspicious to this day that Xi Jinping intends to complete the restoration of China so that he can be in the pantheon of great leaders. That would mean doing something about Taiwan. And this, of course, leaves the United States in a situation having uh, a one China policy that is recognition of China, of, of China, but also obligations to Taiwan under the Taiwan Relations Act to know precisely how to react to this Chinese aggression. It didn't help that Xi Jinping also laid out a strategy uh, and uh, an ambition to surpass the United States in frontier technologies like AI and quantum computing, and to build China's domestic indigenous capability in areas like, um, in areas like semiconductors. And so all of a sudden, this uh, decision to invite China into the international economy uh, to hope for Chinese economic growth 
Some say it looks as if it backfired because China took advantage of the international economy without really conforming to its rules and then began to act on that economic power to uh, further Chinese strategic and military goals, military buildup in a way that looks like it is trying to push the United States out of the Indo-Pacific. So great power rivalry with Russia, a declining power, but a disruptive one that is showing how much disruption it can actually carry out. And China, a power that has risen and is also uh, a problem of how to manage uh, that rise, particularly given that China has become more aggressive. Now, I'm just going to comment on one final point, and I will then uh, we can open up for questions. Uh, there is a, an argument out there that this great power rivalry should be understood not in terms of the kind of 19th century notions of great power rivalry, but really in ideological terms, authoritarian versus democracy. You would have heard Nancy Pelosi use that as her, uh, her uh, justification for going to Taiwan. And it's easy to see why that argument would be a, a strong argument. After all, Putin and Xi Jinping are both authoritarians. They have made clear that they intend to have what they called a relationship without limits. And there is a lot of rhetoric and a lot of writing out of both countries about how the decadent West, uh, the failing West, that they are the future, whether the Chinese believe it's through a kind of technocratic communism or the Russians who actually claim to be the heirs to the cultural heritage of the Western world. Uh, they do have a strong ideological bent in their rhetoric and in uh, the way that they work together. It's also true that uh, Sinologists will tell you that Xi Jinping has become the most uh, Marxist-Leninist or really the most Maoist leader in China since Mao with ambitions for a China that would push its, its system past uh, its borders. But I will argue to you that while it is possible to make that argument about this great power rivalry, it might be a mistake to cast it in those terms exclusively. Uh, and that is because if, in fact, the United States is going to have the will and the capability to actually deal with this period of great power rivalry, to have the patience that we did not show in Afghanistan, to be able to deal with the continuing terrorist threat as well as the great power rivalry threat, it's going to have to be with allies and with friends. And not all of those who wish to sign on to this project will be democracies. I say that as somebody who believes very strongly in the democratic peace. But I also believe in broad coalitions of countries that will understand the challenges of Russia and the challenges of China. And if you look in particular at what we see in the Indo-Pacific, we see that Chinese uh, aggressiveness, has actually led countries to balance against China. Uh, we have a tendency with the Chinese and with authoritarians in general to have what I'll call authoritarian envy. You know, authoritarians are so smart, they can build great airports, uh, they're strategic, the Chinese believe in Sun Tzu, you know, 5,000 years of history, and so on and so on and so on. Well, I think you could argue that this last couple of years of Chinese foreign policy has been among the dumbest foreign policies that I have seen in my entire time uh, as a foreign policy specialist. What do I mean by that? Uh, who goes to the Himalayan border and beats up Indian soldiers with baseball bats on a border that has been silent for 40 years? Who calls Australia in the wolf warrior diplomacy gum under the shoe of China? Who threatens countries um, if they uh, dare leave Huawei and so forth and so on. And who in their peak and anger about uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, who fires missiles that end up uh, in Japanese waters, hardening the already hard Japanese attitudes about its role in the Asia Pacific. And so um, the United States has a lot going for it in trying to deal with this. It has a strong industrial base. It has a strong economy. 
but it also has something that the Chinese do not have, which is allies and friends. And uh, we need to make sure that that coalition is as broad as possible. And so uh, I think that uh, this is, in fact, uh, authoritarians and, and, uh, and democracies, but we need to enlist those who may not find that language completely appealing while we continue to try to build uh, the democratic peace. <music>